Hi, my name is Kaylee and today I'm going to interview my sister about her recent publication on the last day of the Mesozoic period that was published in Nature. And first off, let's introduce yourself to the viewers. Hi, uh, my name is Melanie. I'm uh, currently a PhD student at Uppsala University in Sweden. Uh, I am the mother of little baby Odin and uh, I'm your bigger sister. Yes. So let's start with how you got to study paleontology and what got you interested in the history of life. Um, I'm not exactly sure how I got started, but I know that as a child I used to um, collect the shells that they were that they recently deposited in the parks. I wouldn't even walk on them, just walk alongside it and collect the pretty ones. Yeah. And I was so curious what these were, so I went to the library. This is pre-internet kids. Um, I went to the library and I, I borrowed all these books and tried to understand them. And I found that some of them were extinct. Yeah. And they were used as what we call guide fossils. So they could tell you something about a certain time. And this just got me fascinated. And then I would like play around with the tools of my dad. And in the shed, I would find this dried up lizard and just anything dead. Yeah. It's my interest. And I'm yeah. aware that some people think that's messed up. But um, uh, I decided to, after finishing high school, um, uh, and I finally made my way to university, uh, I had decided to study earth sciences because I thought it was the most fascinating thing. I for long doubted to go for history, but history is too short for me. Yeah. Um, so I went for, for the history of the earth and eventually for history of life. Um, I did my bachelor's in earth sciences at the University of Amsterdam. Then I did my master's in paleoclimatology at the Free University of Amsterdam or the VU. Um, and uh, I did all these research projects on um, uh, Rhynchosauroides uh, footprints from the early middle Triassic of Winterswijk, um, uh, paleoclimatological reconstruction of Winterswijk, uh, swimming traces from Winterswijk, um, yes. but also now I, I managed to find my way into North Dakota and um, uh, for, my mo for my final thesis, find the season in which the, the, the era of the dinosaurs ended. So maybe you can tell the viewers how many fossil excavations you've been a part of. Oof. Um, so that's at least four in Winterswijk, but they're like huge. They're like two week excavations every time. And yeah, it's amazing. And the last last times I didn't even go as a student anymore. So yeah, you really feel like you've, you've got you've, you've got it. You, yeah, you, you have it in the fingers, uh, as we say in Dutch. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, let me see, I did Cruzy twice. And there they have like Titanosaurus, like the really big long necks mm. from the Cretaceous. Um, uh, one time in Opole, which is almost the same period of time as Winterswijk, but then in Poland. Mm. Uh, and Krasiejow, uh, but that was more like a visit, but that was wonderful because that, that's... Um, uh, they have like Devonian, but they also have um, uh, Triassic, and I'm now actually working on Devonian material, so it all comes together again. Um, once I went to Solnhoven, which was part as an as an excursion from um, uh, the EAVP conference, the European Association of Vertebrate Paleontologists, and that's where they find Archaeopteryx. Mm. So, if you can go there, it's sort of like on your <gasps> on every paleontologist's dream dig list. Um, yeah, um, didn't get didn't find a Archaeopteryx, but uh, I, I was allowed to I think spend like a couple of hours digging there, and it was just the best. And I, I have all these partial fishes from there, and I'm that's really very cool. happy. Um, then twice in Wyoming, once with uh, Naturalis, the National uh, uh, Natural History Museum of the Netherlands. In, in Leiden. Leiden, yeah. And uh, we did the Triceratops dig. I'm, yes. I'm quite sure you've picked it up in the news. It's like a mass grave of Triceratops. Mm -hmm. It's fantastic to be part of that. Um, once with uh, the Black Hills Institute for research uh, in uh, Hill City in North, uh, South Dakota, but we excavated in Wyoming as well. And that same summer, I went to Tannis in North Dakota. Yes. And, uh, and, and, and dug up the fish that I got to study for this paper. Yes. Okay. So that's a dozen or something like that. Yeah, approximately. Your master research led to the manuscript that was recently published by Nature, which declares that the Mesozoic ended in Boreal Spring. What exactly are the Mesozoic and Boreal Spring? And how did you get involved with studying this topic? 
Well, in the geological time scale, we give names to larger and smaller periods of time because they are documented in the rocks. So it's more or less we name the rocks and then the era gets the name of uh, these rocks. The three larger eras are known as the Paleozoic, the era of old life, the first life, yes. the Mesozoic, the era of the reptiles, mm -hmm. and the Kenozoic, the era of the mammals. But we no longer really use the term Kenozoic, it's now become the Paleogene. So the entire system has collapsed with this new name, but yeah, that's how the division uh, has come about. The Mesozoic encompasses three periods. I've already named the Triassic briefly, but uh, it starts with the Triassic in which the first dinosaurs emerged. You also have like these fascinating marine reptiles. Um, uh, let's just say that the Triassic was also a really dramatic time. Okay. So the end Permian extinction um, was the largest mass extinction in the history of life. Okay. And then Triassic is like a clean slate and life starts again. And within a few millions of years, you've got all of these fascinating new groups, among which also the dinosaurs. Yes. Then in the Jurassic, they diversified greatly. And um, they, you really get, start to get the clades that we know, like the long-necked dinosaurs, the theropods, the ornithischians. And then in uh, the Cretaceous, finally, we end up with the ones that everybody knows. Yes. The T-Rex, the Triceratops, the Hadrosaurs. And they only live in North America, but that's the ones that everybody knows, but they only live in North America. Yeah. Well, boreal spring is spring as we know it. Mm -hmm. uh, higher latitude, northern hemisphere, spring. Okay. If you live too close to the equator, you don't really have seasons. Yes. If you live in the southern hemisphere, we call it austral spring. Okay. So boreal spring coincides with austral autumn because it's always opposite, northern hemisphere climate and southern hemisphere, uh, sorry, season, northern hemisphere season and southern hemisphere season, they are always opposite. So uh, boreal spring uh, happens simultaneous to austral autumn. How I got started uh, with this project? Well, in the beginning of 2017, I was, um, I was sitting in, I remember it wasn't a lecture, it was a presentation uh, by Emeritus Professor Jan Smit. Uh, and he gave a, um, a presentation on the last day of the Cretaceous. And I was like, what? This is fascinating. Um, and Jan Smit, he's, he's very well known. He, is, uh, uh, he discovered uh, the iridium layer that proves that there was a meteorite impact that uh, killed the dinosaurs okay. at the same time as Walter Alvarez. Jan Smit published in June 1980 and Walter Alvarez pu published in uh, May 1980. Wow. And or vice versa, but that doesn't matter. They're great friends. And uh, Jan Smit published in Nature, uh, uh, Walter Alvarez published in Science. Um, everybody remembered Walter Alvarez and Jan Smit is very happy to be named Jan Smit, very anonymous in the Netherlands. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, but he was giving a presentation uh, about an excavation he did in Tanis, North Dakota, and he described that he had fishes that had impact spherules in their gills. I will quickly explain this. When you have a meteorite impact, then the impact rock, so the rock that the meteorite lands into, it get, gets fired up into space. Yes. It gets hot from mm -hmm. the friction with the, with the atmosphere. And then it melts, and then in space, it crystallizes. And there is a gigantic difference between rock formation, so from liquid to uh, solid in space, versus on Earth. Yes. If you have a rock forming on Earth, such as from a volcano, if, uh, as it's liquid, then the lighter elements rise to the top. If you have a rock forming in space, then the lightest elements stay in the center. Okay. If you, uh, there's a video from Andre Kuiper in the International Space Station mm -hmm. where he blows an air bubble into a water drop and it stays in the center, even though it's lightest. And that's what happens. So all of these rocks look like that bubble. Yeah. And then they rained back down on Earth. So they got deformed slightly because they've got a new layer of friction from the atmosphere and yes. they heat, heat it up again. Um, but they finally, they rain down again. For the people who don't know who <laughs> André Kuipers is, he's a Dutch astronaut who went to the International Space Station a couple years ago. And we're all very proud of him because mm -hmm. he's the only Dutch person who went to the International Space Station. <laughs> I think he set a record at that time as yeah. well for longest. Yeah, stay. so that was, in, for us, that's incredible. So we all know him, yeah. but for the viewers from America and other countries, for clarification. So he was giving this presentation and he described these fishes 
with these impact ferals in their gills. Mm -hmm. So they died on the day. Yeah. They did some calculations and it, it shows that these impact ferals, they need roughly 15 to 30 minutes to come back to Earth. That's so within 15 long. to 30 minutes after the big kaboom, the fish died in a side chain. And I'll explain the side chain later. Yes, I believe you, you wanted to ask me about that, so I'll save that. Yeah. But so I had just be performed an isotopic study to restore, reconstruct a climate of Winterswijk, early middle Triassic, rocks, not very high resolution, big gaps, but I knew what to do. So yeah. I said, you have these fishes that died on the day. Yes. What if we measure their bones? We can reconstruct the climate on land for the last years. Yeah. And then Jan Smit was excited. He was like, this sounds like a good project. He introduced me to Robert De Palma. Robert De Palma got excited. He said, sounds like you know what to do. Come over, let's dig some fish. So I went to Tannis and it was a phenomenal deposit. It's like a layer and then fish in all in the same direction and a little on the layer on top fish in the opposite direction because that's what a side chain does. It just moves back and forth and back and forth. It's insane. And that's all just fossilized in place. That's insane. And then you, you remove the gill cover and you see tectites or impact ferals under there in the gills. So we dug some fish and while we were there in the field, Walter Alvarez also visited, I had my little fan moment. I've seen him <laughs> twice already, but I had my little fan moment. He's a phenomenal guy as well. Jeroen, my final supervisor, he was like, no, you can find the last season. And at first we, we, he tried to send me into like why it would be important. He was like, maybe, maybe, um, maybe it matters how the meteorite impacted. And I'm like, no, that atmosphere is like gone when this giant rock comes in. That's yeah. not relevant. Yeah. But what is relevant is what animals are doing when it comes down. Yes. Talk about more about that later. But um, yeah, I mean, that's how we decided to find the time of the year that this giant rock impacted in the Yucatan Peninsula in, in a little town called Chicxulub. It's really a little town. <laughs> um, and, and killed the non-avian dinosaurs. It's crazy. It sounds like quite a challenge to pinpoint the season of an event that took place tens of millions of years ago. How was it possible to prove that the Cretaceous Paleogene mass extinction circa 66 million years ago must have started during boreal spring? Well, n normally I wouldn't even think this is possible. But yeah. generally speaking, in most of these extinctions, we have cores from the ocean. So we have documents, documentation from marine life, and they often take like a thousand years to, to register. So that's also the resolution, a thousand years. And here we have an intra-year resolution. And that's all because we can prove that they died on the day. And we can prove that everything they, they documented were the last years. Yeah. So all I had to do was decipher their bones and decipher what, what, what records growth, what records summer, and what records non-growth, what records winter. Yeah. And once we got there, we realized, hey, we have a case we can get somewhere. So, and, and they recorded seasonality. We found that they had recorded seasonality. So yeah, we felt we had a strong case. So we pursued it. Of course. When did you realize that you had sufficiently strong evidence to sufficiently support your conclusion that the Mesozoic ended in boreal spring? I have one almost complete fish. Um, it's a paddlefish, but without the paddle. The paddle is like this giant thing in the front. Um, and that's absent. I'm sure you can show a picture. Uh, and that, that part is absent and everything behind the... Um, well, I would say behind the uh, shoulder or the ribs. or They don't have ribs. But around that area is missing. Um, so I had a partial paddlefish. Uh, and what we found is we scanned them uh, at the ESRF, the European Synchrotron Radiation Facility in France. And um, we scanned them there and we found that these gills these, uh, contain these uh, impact ferals or tectites. And then we looked, did they impact anywhere else? Is there any chance that this fish made it? You know? Yeah. Is there any chance that this fish swallowed them and was like, oh, this is fine. Uh, I'm just going to swim off now and die, uh, I don't know, a thousand years later. No, there were no impact ferals further down the body. So he didn't 
digest them. He didn't process them. He didn't survive the no fact that they were there. Exactly. He got them yeah. in the gills and he died. But also, they didn't enter post mortem. It's not like it was already dead from the side and then they came down and. And it rained down through the body. The, exactly. Yeah. There were nothing perfor perforated the body. It was just, it was completely intact. I even have the brain in the scan. This fish has very good preservation. So. And then I have six more fish, but I didn't take those full fish. Um, we excavated them in the field, and because Robert said, well, have hundreds of these fish, if you want some of their bones, just break them. That's a hard thing to do as a paleontologist. It was like, ah, oh, this paddlefish dentary. <laughs> I'll just take home. <laughs> yeah, I had to do that a couple of times. So I have yeah. uh, three paddlefish denturies, one, uh, two actually in one section, because uh, um, they were on top of my sturgeon, so I couldn't excavate the full fish anyway. And when once I pulled out the block with the dentary, I turned it around and said, there's another dentary. Because apparently there was another paddlefish on, under there. This entire excavation had this giant problem of, oh no, another fossil. Because every time you tried to clear one, you couldn't because there was another one on top and adjacent yeah. to it. And it was a massive challenge. Uh, but I collected three uh, paddlefish dentaries and uh, three sturgeon pectoral fin spines, and I collected these ele elements specifically because they are either dermal, dermal or perichondral bone. And this is the type of bone that grows oppositionally. So what that means is like a tree ring. Yeah, every year grows a new layer. So every year in summer, as it grows, or spring and summer as it grows, uh, the osteocyte lacunae, they uh, get bigger and the growth zone gets larger and then when autumn comes uh, you start to get an annulus so you start to get short lines following up on each other and the last one is the one that we call a lag a line of arrested growth because actually that lag is sort of deposited as soon as the new growth season starts because then it's just the end of the annulus so a full year in bone is a, is a zone with the osteocytes and then you get the annulus, mm -hmm. and then the last line is the leg, and then you enter a new year. Yes. So I knew that. So we, I knew that I had to have these bones. I, I studied the literature on the plane <laughs> there. Uh, so I knew I needed those bones, and I took them, we took them back, and then, and then we studied them. And we quickly saw that these legs were there, the annulus was there, the osteocytes we could see with the microscope. Uh, I really needed the expertise of uh, Sophie Sanchez and Kunstein for that. It was all new for me. I had never done histology. So that was pretty clear, but I, I started the project with I want to do isotope analysis. But the sample size, I had to like drill out these tiny growth curves in, in bone and it was like this big and it would fail and it would fail and it would fail. Mm -hmm. And then finally, uh, Suzanne from, um, uh, from the VU, she decided to use the cold trap together with Jeroen to use the cold trap to freeze the samples in place and do isotopic analysis. And that's when we found that during the growth zones, the bones are enriched uh, carbon-13. And when they don't grow, they are not enriched in carbon-13. And That's a good thing to know. <laughs> these fish, these fish, they uh, consume stuff like copepods, diatoms, microorganisms, tiny microorganisms and what these do is um, you have a certain amount of uh, carbon-12 in the atmosphere and you have a certain amount of carbon-13 in the atmosphere. Neither of them are uh, uh, nuclear uh, or unstable, they're all stable. Um, but the thing is that these critters, they don't do this consciously, but they have a preference for carbon-12. It's a little bit easier for them to make sugar of and that's what they need. They use the sunlight to make sugar. And they don't need carbon-13. It's a bit too big. Okay. It's, it's too difficult. So what they do is they deposit that carbon-13 in their exoskeleton. So anything that eats them gets slightly enriched in carbon-13. Oh. So what I find with this paddlefish is when it comes spring and summer, carbon-13 goes up. When it comes autumn, winter, it goes down. And that's what I see, like a cycle of a couple of years. Yeah. And that's when we knew we have two lines of evidence. Yeah, we have the bones and we have the carbon record. That's really cool. The publication also presents a few explanations about how the season in which the Mesozoic ended contributed to the selectivity of the extinction. 
What do you mean with selectivity of the extinction? And how did you relate the season of the meteorite impact with this selectivity? Like I mentioned before, this was not the most dramatic extinction in the history of life, but it yeah. is one that bothers most geologists and biologists and paleontologists. Mm -hmm. And that's because it's selective, as you yeah. say. So if you look at the tree of life mm -hmm. and you look at the Permian moss extinction, then of all of the branches, a large portion is cut. And then okay. after the Permian and you move into the Triassic, most of them grow back. Or, yeah. or grow in different species, different taxa, whatsoever. But it's sort of like on the whole scheme of things, everything gets, yeah. uh, gets uh, really affected by it. And when you look at the end Cretaceous moss extinction, it's like one or two branches are like completely cut off. Yes. And the rest is fine. I'm not saying nothing went extinct there, but mm -hmm. no, no massive other clades were hurt as much as, for instance, the dinosaurs, yeah. the non-avian dinosaurs, I must say. I mean, you have to imagine, there's a sort of um, timeline. So you have this massive impact, then you get these tectites raining down, like I said, within an hour. Mm -hmm. I mean, it lasts longer, it starts within an hour. Yes. You get an infrared heat wave. If you are standing at the surface, compare that to being too close to the nuclear testing ground. Yeah. You don't want to be there. And no. there's a reason they make sure nobody is there. Yeah. So, okay, you need to survive that first. Only, unlike a nuclear test site, it's not like you can go further away, really, and be safe. It, this one just circumvents the Earth. Yeah. And um, then there's this giant poisonous dust cloud that sort of like as a curtain moves gradually to cover the Earth. And then slowly it gets cold, uh, you've got acid rain. It's just a whole bunch of non-comfortable things. And what happens then is you have an extinction from the floral side up. Because as soon as the plants die, yeah. you, get your, you, you lose your primary produ production of food. Yeah. So plants die, grazers die, predators die. So it's, it's really dramatic. But this is no, no different than any of the other extinctions. Yeah. So what is different then? Well. Maybe it's different that it happened during a sensitive time. I'm not sure it did. I'm not sure if spring is the sensitive time or if, because that's really what I'm hypothesizing, but there's not been enough study uh, as to the effect of seasons. And, yes. and we may just uh, invite a lot of people to start researching this now. But so there's many animals that made it that are known to be burrowers. For instance, some mammals, they hibernate for nine months. So if you look at the difference between the uh, Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere, I don't necessarily, for instance, see a difference between, oh, there were no mammals on the Northern Hemisphere that would uh, be in burrows. But the real difference is, were they in their burrows? Yeah. Because if you were on the surface, you died. Yes. So you needed to be underground. Birds can go into torpor. Uh, crocodiles can do estivation. There's many groups of animals that have made it that have their um, survival techniques. I know birds and crocodiles and some other reptiles, they can do it actually quite abruptly. Okay. Um, but for instance, even mammals, they already needed to be underground. If they were not underground... At the moment at of the impact moment, with the... Yeah. yeah, then they didn't have a chance. And then, of course, then you need to survive the other sequence of events, but that's no different than the other extinctions. Yeah. The catastrophe is the difference. Yes. And the fact that it has such a specific timing. Yeah. And maybe, because what you see is that in the Southern Hemisphere, it appears as if, as if the rebound was much, much faster. So maybe, just maybe, it's because it was autumn and the sensitive critters were underground. Yeah. Preparing for winter. It's a good hypothesis. It should be tested. Yeah. You're listed as the first author of the paper, but can you tell us something about the other co-authors? Yes, of course. Professor Jan Smit, or Emeritus Professor Jan Smit, uh, he, uh, like I said, simultaneously with Walter Alvarez, discovered the meteorite impact as the cause for the end Cretaceous mass extinction. Uh, he is my second supervisor, actually, because uh, of the way I approached him and, if, and I found the project. Yeah. Uh, Dennis Fute is a postdoctoral researcher at Uppsala University. Her synchrotron scanned uh, the materials um, 
because he did have his PhD initially at the ESRF, so uh, he knew how to do it. Yeah. Uh, he's also my partner and uh, the father of Odin. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, Camille Berrier is a PhD, was was a PhD student at the ESRF. She is now Dr. Camille Berrier. Um, mm. She studied Egyptian crocodile mummies, uh, actually. So uh, I might have to get in contact yeah, with I her. Might have to, uh, yeah, yeah, no, no, that's could be a nice idea. Uh, she also helped with scanning of our fishes. Uh, we actually scanned some of our bones on top of a baby mummy head. Paul Tafaro is a, the synchrotron scanning wizard of, uh, of fossils. Uh, he helped with scanning, concatenating, processing all of the scanning data. Um, and he didn't have to, but he also asked me critical questions when I was segmenting to make sure that I didn't deviate too far from my research question, because everything was interesting and I was all of this tremendously cool data was uh, uh, was very new to me. Uh, Sophie Sanchez is an associate professor at Uppsala University. Uh, she studies the fin to limb transition from the Devonian of early tetrapods. Uh, she is actually an expert in histology and I wasn't too familiar. Yeah. And uh, Kuhn Stein, who I'll mention in a second, he introduced me first. Uh, but Sophie Sanchez, because she was also the supervisor of Dennis, I knew her quite well. Uh, and I could ask her some questions because she happened to be at the ESRF when I was having my questions. Yes. So it was perfect and, uh, and she helped me so much that of course she uh, deserved a place in the author list. Then Kuhn Stein uh, was a postdoctoral researcher in Brussels. Uh, he performed the micro x-ray fluorescence, which we used to determine if the bones were diagenetically altered. Okay. So for instance, um, they can, you can have a mineral exchange between the sediment and the rock. And if you have that, then you can measure the isotopes all you want, but it's probably not going to be the record of the bones anymore. Yeah. So we needed to discern that first, and he did that. And he actually showed me the first, oh, these are the growth zones, this is a lag. And he helped me get, get familiar with histology yeah. uh, for the very first time. Suzanne is, yeah, she's my, my isotopic queen. Uh, her and Jeroen uh, together, they uh, implemented the cold trap and, and, and we scanned uh, material that was 50 micrograms per sample. That's uh, really small. That's really small. <laughs> and if she had not gone through all of these efforts, we wouldn't have that line of evidence. So I am eternally grateful to Suzanne. And Jeroen, he's my main supervisor, Jeroen van der Lubbe. He's assistant professor at the VU. Uh, he's an expert in, in reconstructing climate in longer and shorter timescales from cores uh, to stalagmites, uh, like the, uh, the droopy down uh, mm -hmm. thing in uh, caves. Uh, and, and now also uh, uh, fish dentaries and pectoral fin spines. That's really awesome. You had, you had everyone you needed. I had you. everyone I needed. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. So can you explain to our audience what a Saiche is and how it differs from a tsunami? Um, so they're, they're, in a way they're very, very similar. So a tsunami is uh, often caused by uh, an earthquake that happens under the ocean or very close to the ocean, but certainly that involves an oceanic plate. Yeah. And then the water moves through the uh, primary waves and the secondary waves, or actually the primary waves and the secondary waves of the shock from the earthquake, they cause the movement of the water. Yeah. And then that water, I think we've all heard a tsunami warning, hopefully not too many of us, um, but we know that the tsunamis are forecasted. It's yeah. like in 10 hours, the tsunami from the earthquake in Japan will reach Hawaii. Yeah. Or 14 hours. It, it's a long time frame. Um, Usually, yeah, just like it moves in, in slowly. 2004, it, really it happens moves. really quickly for the people close to exactly the closer the you are, yeah. then the, 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 the sooner it happens. But the, the water moves slowly, yeah. So it, it depends on how far away you are if it yeah. takes long. Um, a Saichi is different in the fact that it moves through surface waves, so through the Earth's crust, yeah. And for instance, like the Earth's crust, like on, on land it doesn't really vibrate. We don't notice it that much. It doesn't cause like earthquakes all the way around. But you can best compare it to if you have like a giant gym room. Yeah. And you put a giant jacuzzi on the one end and you drop an anvil on the other end. Mm -hmm. when, as soon as you drop that anvil, the water in that jacuzzi starts sloshing back and forth and back and forth. 
Yeah. And that's because the shock wave, the, sur the surface waves, will move through water and it just does so violently. Yeah. If you, uh, if you look at the sidechain in tennis, then you really see that the water moved forwards, backwards, forwards, backwards. Because you also found while the fish move yeah. in like the different exactly. layers. But at the same time, we also have these tectites that fell down in 15 to 30 minutes. Yeah. Too soon for, it's like thousands of kilometers away. I think 3,500 kilometers away from the Chicxulub location. So it's like too far away for a tsunami to be this quick. Yeah. And also we're not really sure if the Western Interior Seaway that still existed before then, if it was still there at the latest Cretaceous. Yeah. So we're not even sure if there was a direct l body of water from uh, the, the, the Gulf of Mexico up to North Dakota. Likely not. Yeah. So you have this remnant sea. You have the Tanis River because paddlefish is a fresh water. So mm -hmm. we know it had to be fresh water. But sturgeons are anadromous. They move from marine to fresh water. So they could have been anywhere. Yeah. You have these uh, uh, fishes in those directions, but we also have the tectites impacted. We have these tiny craters. You start to see the rock do this. And then we excavated it quickly, slowly, until we found the tectite in there. That's really cool. So the water comes back and forth and back and forth. And if you want to see an example of that, because it can be hard to believe if you don't know what to imagine? I'll send you a video. Yeah. There was an earthquake that knocked off Fukushima in mm -hmm. uh, Japan in, I believe, 2011. It caused a sideshow in Norway, in the fjords of Norway. A tsunami could never have gotten there. No. However, so you have this footage of a calm fjord. A fjord does not have waves. No, no, it doesn't. <laughs> so. These people in Norway, they were like, what is the water coming in like this? Yeah. So they recorded it and you see that the water is coming back and forth and back. That's crazy. And, forth. and that's a side chain. That's really cool. The mass extinction that was triggered by the Chicxulub impact resulted in the eradication of circa 76% of species living at the time. Can you explain to our audience which groups went extinct and which groups survived? What do we know about the differences between the life forms that went extinct and those that survived into the Paleogene period? You asked the question exactly right, because there is nothing about the Paleogene period that would not be something that the dinosaurs, for instance, could have inhabited. Yeah. So there's no real big climatic transition. There's, there's really just the impact. So what we know is that, well, most famously, the non-avian dinosaurs went extinct. But birds, avian dinosaurs, yeah, yeah all birds are dinosaurs, people. Um, <laughs> there are more than 10,000 species of birds today. That's a lot. <laughs> they diversified tremendously in the Paleogene. Yeah. Um, and if you really want to see that birds are dinosaurs, look at the, the, the feet of an ostrich or an emu or um, just compare a chicken and imagine the chicken um, having arms instead of wings. Yeah. The stands, the pose, it's all very familiar. Yeah. Um, so, but also pterosaurs, um, which are not dinosaurs, you know, the, mm -hmm. the flying reptiles with the, the, the sort of like finny skin-like uh, membranous wings. If you even compare the wings of a bird and, and the arm of a dinosaur, they're all like one, two bones, and then some fingers that are left, and all the feathers are attached to here. In a pterosaur, it's like the full fingers that sort of give hold the web that okay. that shape the uh, uh, the wings. Yeah, or that's in bats. I don't know crap about mammals, um, but these wings are really different. And also the, the hip joints and the, the shoulder joints of pterosaurs are so different. They're a really different group from dinosaurs. Yeah. But we also had marine reptiles, um, not just the ones from Winterswijk in the Triassic. They had already gone extinct. Um, but actually that was in the end, Triassic extinction. But the um, Mosasaur from uh, Maastricht went extinct uh, at the end of the Cretaceous as well. Ichthyosaurs... Um, the Loch Ness monster, um, mm. Plesiosaurs, they also went extinct. 
And there's a, there's been some researchers saying, well, maybe it's been like a weight discriminant factor. So if you were too big, you would die because, well, most of the things that were big went extinct. Yeah. So granted. But then why did crocodiles survive? Yeah. And turtles? Sharks? They're big as well. Like pretty big. Pretty big. <laughs> Uh, so it's not that. It's also not being on the top of the food chain that makes you more vulnerable. So it, it really has to do with something different. There is a really strange discrimination in here. And that's why we went to looking for the season to see maybe, maybe there is something there. Maybe there's it a correlation. Is, well, not necessarily. The thing is that everything contributed to it being so selective. And we don't know everything. Yeah. So understanding the season might bring us closer to understanding the selectivity. I am not saying that this proves that it, it was because of the season. I'm saying we now know the season. So we can now start looking to what were the patterns of these animals? When did they, when did they feed? When did they breed? When did they hibernate? When did they estivate? What were, what were their seasonal patterns, their life yeah. cycles? Because if you had like long incubation times and you laid your eggs just before the impact happened, then they were never gonna hatch. Yeah. But if you had long incubation time and you laid your eggs underground just before, then different story. Yeah. So it, it all, there's, it's a lot more complex than just the season. But I do think that knowing the season helps. Okay. How do you see the future of your hypothesis? What would be required to further test your interpretation? And which evidence would disprove the concept of the KPG impact having occurred during boreal spring? So the finding of a directly impact related deposit having formed in a certain season not only tells us something about this particular event, but also presents a methodology that could be used on other event, event deposits that you can date. Yeah. Certain dramatic volcanic eruptions. I mean, we all know roughly around when they happened, but yeah. we, can, we can pinpoint the season. Yeah. We can read the bones. If you have like direct casualties buried under volcanic ash, then you can pinpoint the season in which that volca volcano erupted. So for instance, just, I, I might, not be very knowledgeable about this, but like the Vesuvius volcano in 79 AD, yeah. with the Pompeii victims, we mm -hmm. could find out in which it season. It naturally depends on the preservation of the bone, uh, but yes, it's possible. That would be possible. That's really cool. That's maybe a study for someone else who's watching this. You never know. That would be nice. Yeah. <laughs> Provided that you, the annual pattern that you find in the bones is robust and unaltered, you can date um, the season of really dramatic events and it can maybe help us understand a little bit more why some of them were so specific. Yeah, really cool. cool. Thank you. This was a lot of fun for me to do. and uh, For me too. <laughs> <laughs> having my sister in my house with a camera, it's a bit strange, but for me it was a lot of fun. Yeah, for me as well. I hope the viewers had a lot of fun as well. But so. we have reached the end of this particular video. If you enjoyed watching, then don't forget to give it a thumbs up. Subscribe if you'd like to see more of these kind of videos and click that bell icon if you want to be notified every single time I upload. If you haven't seen my previous videos yet, then click the card in the upper right corner above the pink hair. Click the links in the description down below or click one of the videos in the end card. I'd also like to thank my patrons. And with that said, thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Please go check out the publication in Nature. In the future, I will have a short follow-up interview about how everything went with the publication. So stay tuned for that. Bye, guys.